Thank you all for being here. Um, this is a real pleasure and a topic that I'm strongly interested in. And um, I want to say thank you all again for being here to listen. And I want to thank a couple of particular people on the sides here. Um, I'm a father of relatively newborn twins, and I know how hard it is to take care of children. And I see some people here that have brought their uh, babies and small kids uh, to participate. Um, so I think it's great that we have families here to listen and to uh, take all this information in. And so yeah. I understand packing diapers and you know strollers. It's it's very hard to do. And so just thank you for that for those that did this. Anyways, we're gonna talk about um, opioids and back pain. And I just need to figure out how to advance. I'm assuming it's this button. Uh, excellent. Okay, so I have to stay here. Okay, so um, you've heard a lot about the interdisciplinary team-based approach when it comes to pain management. And I just wanna remind everybody of how important that is, that you need multiple providers, physicians, physical therapists, pain psychologists, other folks involved in your care to optimize your outcomes. And it's unrealistic to think that any one single treatment is gonna give you an optimal outcome. So it's all about patient-centered care with the team, with the patient's goals and their functions in mind, okay? And we're gonna get into why that's important in the context of opioids in just a moment. So again, I stole this from Dr. King who gave an outstanding talk just a few moments ago. So you see the patients in the middle, their particular problem, their goals for function, and you see surrounding them in smaller circles, the physician, the physical therapist, and the pain psychologist all cross-talking to each other. That way the right hand knows what the left hand is doing, and all the care can be coordinated. So keep that in mind as I tell you about opioids. So this is an image of explaining what an opioid actually is, that way we're all on the same page. So an opioid um, is a medication such as morphine or hydromorphone or Vicodin, you may have heard of these things, and they're derived from the opium poppy, which is a plant, it's a flower. And you can see up here um, the sap coming out of the flower. Um, that is actually where opioids are extracted from. And once those medications are made off of that sap, um, these medications work in the brain and in the spinal cord, what we call the central nervous system, to try to quiet down any kind of pain-related signaling or activity that's occurring. So that's how it provides pain control. And opioids are an ancient, ancient um, methodology and medication for treating pain. It's been around since 3000 BC, perhaps even earlier. And it's a well-proven way of treating pain. But as I said, that's just one particular tool of the many tools that exist for pain. So it's just a small piece of the puzzle. And it's unrealistic to think that just one particular thing is gonna make a large outcome. Now, when it comes to opioids, we need to think about what are the risks and what are the benefits and what are the expectations associated with it. We need to put it into context. So we're gonna go through that right now. So what are the benefits of opioids? Well, like I said, uh, it's a true and through method for controlling pain. It's an outstanding treatment if you've had surgery, if you have an acute, what we call an acute injury or an injury that's fresh. For some patients, for chronic pain that's been going on for a long time, it's well suited for those patients also in certain circumstances. But it always has to be put in the context of a goal and a function. So when I prescribe opioids, for example, I always tell the patients, please use this medication in conjunction with something that you're doing. So for example, if you're gonna fly on an airplane for five hours to go on a business trip and that's gonna be painful for you, that's an appropriate use of the medication because it's paired with a function. Or let's say you're in physical therapy and you're having trouble getting through that physical therapy session. You pair the opioid with that function or that activity that way you can get more bang for your buck. I don't think it's appropriate to use it and not pair it with a function. You're just giving somebody a sedating medication, but we'll go into that later. So what are some of the risks and what are some of the other things that we need to think about when we're talking about opioids? So it turns out that opioids work on many different systems within the body. So I'm just gonna kinda go from head to toe and talk to you guys about what are the other systems that are involved when opioids are introduced into your system. So starting up top with the head, so they cause sleepiness, they cause sedation. That's not always a good thing because we're trying to optimize function and activity, okay? Um, other things to think about are the cardiopulmonary system. So our heart beats with a particular rhythm, um, lub-dub, lub-dub, you've probably heard people talk about this. So it turns out that certain opioids can change the rhythm of your heart while it's beating. And so you have to think about that if you have heart disease underlying uh, your health concerns. Other things opioids do are they affect the respiratory system. They're what we call respiratory depressants. So they, break, they make your breathing function go down, and that can be 
I hate to say it, could be very dangerous, in some cases even fatal. So we have to be extremely cautious with patients when we dose the opioids because we don't want their respiratory system to go down and frankly have people stop breathing. It's a major problem. Other issues working down further um, are the GI system, so um, the stomach and the gut. Um, opioids are associated with pretty bad constipation, so it's something to be aware of. They affect your, your gut in that way. Um, the skeletal system, they've been associated with osteoporosis, so thinning of the bones, weakening of the bones, making you more prone for fracturing, so something that you need to be aware of. And uh, one other thing that I'm going to spend a bit of time on is testosterone levels. Men and women both have testosterone, and um, moderate to high dose opioids will drop your testosterone levels. And so think about, let's think about this for a minute. Testosterone is a um, hormone in your body associated with energy, with your mood, with libido. And these are things that are very important for optimizing your function. And so now we're talking about a medication that could potentially drop that down. That is not conducive for good pain management care. And so um, for my patients in particular, I will actually, if they're on a moderate to high dose opioid, I will draw their testosterone levels and I'll show it to them in the clinic and say, hey look, a normal person's testosterone is supposed to be at this level, yours is actually lower. That could be contributing to the dysfunction that you have or the lack of energy, whatever it may be. So it's something that we need to talk more about which doesn't get enough attention. So with long-term opioid use, I mentioned before that it works in the brain and in the central nervous system. It does a couple funny things over time that we're gonna talk about. So the first thing that it does, it, ca it causes something called a tolerance. So what that means is, the more medication you take over time, you need more and more opioid to get the same effect that it once gave you. So in the beginning, you take a dose, you get a good effect. Over time, you need more to get that same effect. And as you go up and up and up on the dosing, some of those side effects that we mentioned become more and more concerning. And so you may not be getting the same pain control you once have, but your risks are going up. So you need to be aware of tolerance. And an associated term with tolerance is called cross-tolerance. What that means is, if you're on a particular opioid, let's say it's morphine, and then you decide to take a different opioid, like uh, hydrocodone, you will be tolerant to that other medication too, because they're very similar, and your system has kind of already seen it, okay? The other thing that can happen is something called dependence. What dependence means is that without taking the medication, you go into withdrawal. And there's many medications in the world that cause um, dependence. So for example, let's say you wake up late for work and you miss your cup of coffee. Does any, can any of you tell me what would happen if you miss your cup of coffee? Yeah, everyone's shaking their head. Just shout out some things that would happen. Headache. headache, that's a big one. That is, so people that get headaches by missing their caffeine have a dependence on it. And that's not anything kind of derogatory, so to speak. It's just a natural thing that occurs. It turns out opioids have the same effect. So if you don't take your opioid, you will have withdrawal symptoms. Okay, so I think having realistic expectations for what opioids can do and not do for you is very important, okay? So um, I, I kind of mentioned this before, but just to expect that a single anything, a single injection, a single medication, a single intervention it's going to make a major impact on your pain. It's just not realistic. You need that team-based interdisciplinary approach. And so same goes for opioids. And what concerns me sometimes is I see patients that tell me, well, I took this medication. It didn't give me the effect, so I'm going to go up. And when I went up, it didn't quite give me the effect that I'm looking for, so I went up again. And as I mentioned, the more and more you go up without incorporating the other modalities into your care, you're putting yourself at risk, and you're going to have more side effects. So that is not optimal pain management, okay? And so I would, what I tell my patients when that situation is occurring is, I really think that your pain condition, whatever it is, let's say it's back pain, for whatever reason, it's just not responsive to opioids, and we don't know why. So maybe you should just back off, wean, and try something else, because you're just putting yourself at risk for no good reason, okay? Okay, so... Like with any high risk journey, let's say you're gonna fly into outer space one day, you need flight verification. You know, going into outer space is certainly a lot you know, harder and more involved than taking a red eye you know, from LA to New York. But even with that, there's flight cross checks that occur. There's safety systems that are in place. This is one thing that makes opioids very unique amongst all the other medications that we prescribe in the house of medicine, is that we need a lot of extra safety checks to make sure that you're, you're safe. So I'm gonna outline what some of those safety checks are for opioids. The first one is informed consent. And so I'm gonna ask you guys, who's ever 
filled out an informed consent form, like for surgery, for a procedure, even for the flu shot, sometimes you have to sign them. Okay, I see a lot of hands, so people know what informed consent is. I'm just gonna outline it for those who don't know. Informed consent is a process. It's a process by which the clinician and the patient um, discuss very frankly the risks, benefits, and alternatives associated with whatever risky thing you're gonna do, whether it be a surgery or a medication or whatever. Opioids are no different. So that conversation needs to occur so that everyone is on the same page, and it actually is a document that is signed by the clinician and by the patient both, and then that's filed away and documented. So that's informed consent. The next thing that needs to occur is something that we call patient provider agreements. Sometimes they're called opioid contracts. I personally don't like that terminology, so I just say patient provider agreement. And that basically spells out the rules of engagement between the clinician, the one that's prescribing the medication, and the patient who's taking it. And the reason this is important is because, the, again, these medicines are high risk. And so one thing that these contracts or patient provider agreements often say is you're only going to get this medication from one single source. Because if you're getting it from multiple sources and taking all of that medication, you're at risk for overdosing, and we don't want that to happen. The other things that are outlined in this document, the patient provider agreement, is um, expectations. So again, agreeing that if this medication isn't working well for you, it's not safe to just keep going, going higher, higher. Perhaps it's better to have an exit strategy to get off of that medication and try something else, okay? Um, other systems that we use for monitoring and for safety are um, quite a few. So a lot of, in fact, I think all 50 states now in our country have a database called a Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. PDMP is the acronym. So what this computer database does is all of the pharmacies that patients go to, the pharmacy will send that information to this website that clinicians can look at. So that way we know what medications you're taking, who's providing it to you, and at what dosage. And that's important because if I'm giving a patient an opioid, which again is a risky medication, I need to know if there's other people giving it at the same time. And if I don't know that, you're at risk, okay? So um, you'll probably hear more and more about prescription drug monitoring programs as time goes on. It's, I believe it's already required in California, and it's gonna become required for all clinicians in all states. So it's kind of a hot button topic. Um, two other systems just to mention, one is urine drug testing in the clinic. So um, it's common for patients that are taking opioids to have their urine checked, just to make sure that um, the medications that we believe are there are truly there and that there's nothing else dangerous in the system. Because if those things are found, that would make for an important discussion between the clinician and the patient to make sure that you're safe. And then the last one is in-office pill counts. So having the patient bring their pill bottle to the clinic with whatever medication is left over, and then you count them together. This is an accounting system to make sure that the medication isn't being consumed too, free, too quickly, or if there's a lot left over, to maybe dose reduce, because now you have extra medication in your house that isn't necessary. And we're gonna talk about, in a couple of slides from here, why it's important to think about medications in your house, and the implications for medi medications in your home, and other people that may be in your home, okay? So um, just this week, uh, the FDA came out with a box warning regarding benzodiazepines, which are sedative medications often used for relaxation and for sleep, being mixed with opioids. Because what happens is if you take opioids with other substances that can cause sedation, they work together in what we call synergism. So one plus one doesn't equal two, it equals more than two. And so it puts patients at risk for respiratory depression. So um, benzodiazepines I just mentioned, Alcohol is another one. Never take your opioids with alcohol. That is a recipe for disaster, okay? You're gonna have that synergism effect and have both of these substances reduce your breathing and put you at risk for harm. So never ever do that. The other thing is, if you have a pre-existing respiratory concern, so let's say you're developing pneumonia, you have COPD, asthma, sleep apnea, which is very common in our country right now. You want to be extremely cautious with thinking about how does the opioid interface with that underlying pulmonary problem or lung problem that you have, because now you have multiple insults or multiple issues going on with your respiratory system. So to be honest with you, patients that I have that develop pneumonia and they're on opioids, I want to know, because during that time frame, I'm going to reduce their dose to keep them safer. So just something important to be aware of. Okay, so I just mentioned a moment ago about medications in your house. You wanna make, you've gotta make sure that these medications are absolutely secure, that they're only your medication, they're not to be shared, they're not to be used by anybody else, because the other people that are using them 
We don't know how they're going to respond to that medication. We don't know what their medical history is. You know, perhaps it's a teenager in the home. You know, I don't know if they recognize that taking a lot of these pills can do them harm. And so we don't want people around you and people in the community getting harmed by these medications. So you've got to keep them safe and secure, and they're yours only. They're not to be shared. So just to drive home this point one more time, pain management is a team sport. Optimal outcomes occur when we have multiple uh, clinicians, uh, the physician, the pain psychologist, the physical therapist, and others all working together and communicating to make sure that you have the optimal uh, care for your pain. And just to think that any one single modality is going to make a major impact is just not realistic. So you want to put opioids and all other treatments that you're in in context of that bigger picture. That's all I got. Thank you very much for your attention.